Go ahead and pull out your Bibles. You guys ready for more church? Go ahead, open up your Bibles. Open up to the book of 2 Corinthians this morning. Thank you, worship team. Anybody else thankful for the worship team? So good. Do you like who you're sitting next to? Good. It's not hard around here. There's a lot of good people. A few bad eggs, but, you know, we'll be all right. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5 is where we're going to be this morning. We uh, started a series last week called Jesus Today. The graphic looks like that. Angie Guffey, way to go. I like giving shout outs, so. Started a series last week called uh, Jesus Today, and uh, our, our message last week was about our mission statement, to preach the gospel of the kingdom and to make others great. The series that we're doing is all about trying to uh, figure out how do we as Jesus followers, how do we figure out what, what does Jesus have to do with today? Because, uh, you know, we could talk about Jesus yesterday and, and all of the things that used to happen in the Bible, or we could spend our Christianity waiting for, for what's happening one day, that maybe, you know, one day we'll get to heaven, and everywhere in between, you know, this today stage, we're just kind of making it. But I think God wants us to do more than just make it. I think that we're here for a reason, and that he wants to see his kingdom come in your life, and in our city, and in the things that he's called you to. Does anybody else believe that? So what does Jesus have to do today? Let's talk about Jesus today. Jesus today. And I want to title the message this morning, part two of our series. Uh, it's a very simple title. It's simply this shift. Shift. If we're going to walk with Jesus today, I think that there's some shifts that need to happen for us. And the good news is God is good at helping us with those shifts. God is good. I'm going to read a big chunk of verses right off the bat as we get started. Can you handle that? Can you handle like not like a story first or something like that? We can go straight to a big chunk of the Bible. We're going to read 2 Corinthians uh, 5. We're going to start in verse 6, and we're going to go all the way to 21. So look at your neighbor and say, buckle up. So here we go, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 21, and then we will talk about it. Um, and God's going to move in your life and transform you because it's his word and it's living and active and we're not just reading an old book and we're not just in a building. Anybody come to church this morning? How are we doing? All right. I want something to happen. Verse six, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God. Yep, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer to those who boast on outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in new Christ, he is, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Anybody say amen to the word of God this morning. I was watching a movie the other night. I don't watch movies very frequently, but I was sick this week, and so I figured sick people watch movies. I guess I'll do that. And I watched a movie I had seen before. It's a few years old called Moneyball. Anybody ever seen Moneyball? Brad Pitt, 
I think it's a cool movie because I love baseball and it's just exciting. So I was watching this, this, this movie called Moneyball and it's, it's about the Oakland A's uh, professional baseball team and their general manager, his name's Billy Bean. And uh, they are a team that is trying to make it in a, in a strong division in Major League Baseball. And there's this scene that's my favorite scene where Billy Bean, he, who's played by Brad Pitt, he's coming into the room with all of his number one scouts. And they're in the off season. They've just concluded a strong season. They, they played really well. They made it to the playoffs, but they got uh, kicked out by the Yankees. Boo, yay. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. I guess we're in the Midwest. Nobody really cares about the Yankees. So uh, they, they just lost to the Yankees, and uh, not only did they lose to the Yankees, but they lost to the Yankees, like, again, kind of like most people. The Yankees seem to beat a lot of people. So uh, they, they lose to the Yankees again, and that's really discouraging. So they're trying to figure out how do we make next season better? How do we overcome this hurdle that we just can't get past? The other problem is that not only did they lose the season before, but in the offseason, they were losing their three best players because uh, the Oakland A's didn't have a big bankroll, and so they relied on bringing up their own young talent, and then basically once the young talent got good and all the rich teams could sign them, they lost them. So it's just kind of the cyclical problem that they're running into. So Billy Bean, he's in the room with his scouts, and he's sitting there while all of his scouts are talking about all these young prospects in their system, and they're talking about who's got a strong bat, who, who's got a good arm, who could replace this guy, who could replace that guy. And uh, Billy Bean, at least as Brad Pitt portrays him, he's pretty rude and doesn't really care how people feel about things. So they're all talking, like trying to do their job, and he's just going, blah, blah, blah. And there are all these grown men, and they're like, oh, <laughs> apparently you'd like us to stop talking. And they're having this conversation, and he says, he says guys, 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 we're, we're sitting in here talking about business as usual. It's not business as usual. And they're all looking at him like, what's going on? And, and the, his head scout looks at him and says, Billy, I, I think we all understand the problem. He says, okay, what's the problem? What's the problem? He says, well, the problem is, he says, what's the problem? He says, well, Billy, the problem is we have to replace this guy, this guy, and this guy. The guy, the three main guys they were losing. And Billy says, wrong. And they're all looking at each other like, okay. He says, that's not the problem. He says, the problem is there are rich teams and there are poor teams. And then there's 50 feet of crap and then there's us. <laughs> he says, if we try to play like the Yankees in here, we're going to lose to the Yankees out there. I love this scene for a whole lot of reasons. But mainly, I just, I love that moment of clarity that he brings to his team who are trying to solve, the, they're, they're, all, they're all on the same team, they're all in the same organization, they're all in the same season, they're all aiming for the same thing. They want to build a championship team, but they were going about it different ways. They're going about it different ways, and Billy Bean knew that his scouts needed a shift in how they were addressing the mission they were trying to accomplish. I believe for us as the church that it is the will of God that we as his people display him to the world. I believe that it is the will of God that everybody know him, that everybody have a chance to hear about Jesus and turn their life to him and be made new and come to life in Jesus by the grace of God. I believe that he wants you filled with the Holy Spirit so that you can walk in the power of God in your family, in your workplace, and, and even in the nations of the earth. I believe it is the will of God that his people engage broken cultures and communities with his love. I believe that this is the will of God. And yet, if we're honest, as the people of God, filled with the power of God, so often we can still feel like the scouts in Moneyball. We can feel like the scouts who are sitting around a table trying to figure out how to do it, and the truth is that we're trying to answer all the wrong questions. And we're sitting around a table when we're filled with the power of God, feeling like everything is against us. It feels like kind of like we're the Oakland A's needing the New York Yankees payroll sometimes. And we don't have it. But we aren't the Oakland A's in need of the New York Yankees payroll. We are the body of Christ. We are the people of God. We are saved by the grace of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, so that we can preach the gospel of the kingdom and make others great. That is who we are. 
And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this chunk of scripture that we just read, I, I kind of want it to be like a, a Billy Bean clarity moment for us from the word of God this morning. Because the problem uh, in Moneyball wasn't that they couldn't do it. It was just that they were focused on the wrong things. They needed a shift in their focus. They needed a shift in how they approached the situation that they were trying to engage and address. And I believe that as the people of God, we can do what God is calling us to do. We haven't seen anything yet compared to what God wants to do. You don't have any idea the, the capacity that God wants to use you for his kingdom. But if we're going to do it, we may need a little shift in our approach, a shift in what we're focusing on. And it starts with the first shift I want to talk about this morning is a shift in perspective, a shift in perspective. Give a little background, just because we haven't read enough of 2 Corinthians 5 yet. In chapters 3 and 4 and 5 of, of 2 Corinthians God is giving this beautiful exposition of the gospel. He's giving this amazing explanation of what it is, of what it means for us, and where we as the people of God fit into the story of God. And in chapters 3 and 4, uh, it talks about how, how we are now sufficient. We're now sufficient before God. Not by anything we've done, but simply by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 4, it says this verse that, that by the grace of God, the gospel, God has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's a bunch of big verses in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. And then the shift of perspective that we're, we're talking about, we, we start to get the, the shift of perspective in chapter 5. We start to turn towards there in the second half of chapter 4. It's, it's kind of this build up to this shift moment that I want to talk about this morning. After that verse in chapter 4 I just read, it goes on to explain that we have this light that God has shown into our hearts, and we have it like, like we're his vessels, we're carrying it, but, but the vessels that we are are jars of clay, not the most durable of vessels. We don't always make it through everything, and, and the rest of chapter 4 and, and even the beginning of chapter 5 is kind of this this uh, discourse on, on what it looks like and can feel like to be carrying this gospel in a vessel like a jar of clay. It talks about so the difficulties of following Jesus. It talks about just simply the challenges of life. You get sick, you waste away, our, our, our bodies are growing older and, and wasting away, and yet we're carrying this amazing eternal light, but we're just jars of clay. And you start to feel the tension that at least I, I get it. I feel that tension. That tension of this news is so good. But sometimes things are so bad. I, I want to tell everybody, but nobody wants it. I want to believe it myself, but it's hard. I, I, just, I just don't know. And it leads us into chapter 5, where leading up to where we started this morning, it says that our bodies, they're like an earthly dwelling, like a tent that is fading away, but that there's hope because we have an eternal dwelling. We have an eternal dwelling, eternal life. And while we are in this temporary dwelling, there's this interesting bit where we started to read this morning where there's this language of, of groaning and there's this language of longing for what is mortal to be swallowed up by what is life. There's so much tension in these chapters, and not just a, a social tension or a political tension, but I believe, it's just, I believe it's just the tension that we experience as humanity and the tension that we experience as followers of Jesus. And like I said, this tension clicks with me because God's so good and I'm so weak, and I feel it. I feel it. I feel it when people need more of God, and I feel like all they get is me. <laughs> The world needs Jesus. The world needs us. The world needs the people of God. And, and yet I have a terrible attitude this morning with my wife and kids. <laughs> how, how, how am I supposed to carry this light shown into our hearts, the knowledge of the glory of all of these things? And it's just, it's just me. I know I'm supposed to have impact today. I know that God, God says he wants to use me to bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, but honestly, it's hard. Any other Christians that feel the tension sometimes? Can we just be honest in church? This is an honest message this morning. 
I feel the tension. And, 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 and we echo even these final verses, even where we start to begin to read this morning, that at least I, I feel this sometimes, and not, not at all in some morbid way, but like sometimes it just seems like it would be easier if God would just like take us straight to heaven. Like, what? like, it just seems like it would be easier if, like, when you pray and give your life to Jesus that you just <laughs> float away to heaven, right? Like, it just sometimes be easier to not have to, like, feel like you're figuring it out in between and experiencing so much. This is hard. It's hard being a Christian. I don't even know how good I am at being a Christian most of the time. And it'd be easier if we just prayed the prayer, raised our hand, said, yes, Jesus, I want to follow you, and we just followed him straight up into the clouds. And it's in the middle of this tension. The middle of this tension of 2 Corinthians 3, 4, and 5, this, this tension that we're trying to engage in this series, Jesus today, I mean, ah. It's in the middle of this Jesus today Right now, right here, our world, our life, our weakness, our problems, our inabilities, our strengths, our don't know what to do, our neighbors, our friends, our challenges, our different worldviews, our different things that we're engaging in the world. It's in Jesus today that God wants to mobilize you to impact today, and he speaks by giving you a shift in your perspective on tomorrow. He wants to mobilize you today by shifting your perspective on tomorrow. Where we started this morning, verses 9 and 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So whether we are home or whether we are away, I wish I could just go home. I wish I was away from the body, but I'm not. I wish God would take me now, but he's not. I don't know when he's going to, but he will. But he's not right now, so I can't worry about all that. So whether we are at home or away, what? I just make it my aim to please him. Not my aim to figure it all out. I just make it my aim to please Jesus. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. I just said the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> we're talking about the fear of the Lord. Like, that's not comfortable to say in church. Like, we're happy. We don't talk about the judgment seat of Christ. We've been smiling in church this morning, right? It makes me uncomfortable talking about this. But God in his grace, he's trying to shift our perspective on tomorrow by saying, I want to mobilize you today by keeping you reminded of where you're going to be tomorrow. I know that you're fighting about what decisions do I make right now. I, I don't know what to do with people who disagree with me. Or, or do I call people on this? Or do I just love them? Or do I engage this question? Or do I just walk away from it? Do I, am I being nice if I talk about the truth? Am, I don't know how to engage all of this. And that's where we get immobilized in this lack of clarity. I, I, know what I, I know what I believe, like big picture, but the lack of clarity on what to do today immobilizes me. And God says, I want to give you clarity on how to act today by giving you clarity on where you're going to be tomorrow. And he talks about the judgment seat of Christ. And this isn't this judgment seat of God of saying like, because this is written to a church. This is written to believers. And he, he's writing them, not saying you're going to stand before God and there's going to be like another gavel based on if you're good or bad, are you saved or not? Like we're, we're, we're going to rehash this question. That's not at all what he's saying. That's not at all what he's saying about the judgment seat of Christ. He, he, he's more saying uh, the judgment seat of Christ for the believers is, is not about are you saved or are you not saved. It's more just addressing the question, what did you do with the new life that I gave you? Let's, let's, let's talk about that. Because God wants to reward you for the good things you do with the new life that he gives you. He doesn't just give you new life, but now you get to invest it into his kingdom and see it grow. This is amazing. And it's usually uncomfortable to talk about the fear of the Lord and the judgment seat of Christ and all those sorts of things, but, and, and I, can already, I can already see people I'm losing. I can already see it. I, just, I can just see it from up here. But I want to just keep with me for just a second because if we're going to understand the judgment seat of Christ, we have to understand the other word that the Bible uses for this exact seat. The other word the Bible uses for the judgment seat of Christ is the mercy seat of Christ. It's the mercy seat of Christ. 
when you're trying to engage life today, when you're trying to follow Jesus today, what do I do? What do I say to this person? What do I not say to this person? He says, I want you to think. I want you to think about standing before the mercy seat of Jesus. You're going to give an account for your life. You're going to give an account for that moment of tension when you feel like you've got to choose between A or B. Which one do I do? I don't know which one to do. One sounds good. One sounds bad. Actually, they both sound kind of good, and they both sound kind of bad. You know, I, I just don't know what to do. And Jesus says, I want you to think about standing before me in the end. He says, you, 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 are, you are in the body right now, but you will go away from the body. You will have eternal life, and we will stand before God and give an account for your life. And this sounds so intense, but I'm telling you, this is going to set you free. Because what I'm about to tell you is the way I make most of the decisions in my life. Because I feel like I live so much of my life, like the spiritual stuff or not, just like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like parenting, are you kidding me? Like what are we doing? I, I don't... I don't know what I'm doing. I feel like I'm living my whole life like picking between A and B and like 50-50 at best on either one, you know? Like hopefully this roll the dice, you know? And in these moments of, of, of a lack of clarity, which immobilizes me, what brings me clarity is remembering, okay, I get to stand before Jesus in the end and give an account. So it's like I picture myself all the time standing before God. It's just me and Jesus, nobody else. No Instagram followers, no Facebook friends, no political parties, no family, no friends, no outside influences. They're not going to give any sort of validation to my decision at that moment, so they ought not to now. Somebody said amen. amen. You're freaking yourself out worrying about what people think now, and they're not going to be there then, so don't worry about them now. Wow. See the clarity I'm talking about? It's going to be me and Jesus and who's responsible for the decision I'm about to make? Me. That means this decision, nobody else can make it for me, which is so freeing. Because don't you just feel like you're being yanked around sometimes? Forced to do some things? No, you get to make your decisions. And you get to stand before God. And, and, I, and I just think, okay, God, I've got A and B. Which one am I going to want in that moment? Which one am I going to want then? I'll roll with that one now. See the clarity? It's so activating because I feel paralyzed when I can't choose and all of a sudden it becomes really obvious most of the time. Oh, I definitely want B. B, B, B's the one. <laughs> but let's be honest, sometimes it's still not that clear. At least for me, sometimes it's still not that clear and I need to remember that the seat isn't the judgment seat where God says, give me A or B, you better pick the right one. It's the mercy seat. Where I get to say, God, sometimes I'm 50-50 still. And I'm like, God, I still have no idea. So I'm just going to, uh, I got to pick one. So we'll go with A. And I just say, God, I'm going with A. And if I'm wrong, I just need your mercy. And he says, you're standing before the right seat. This is who you are. You are standing before the living God. You are standing before the mercy seat of Jesus. You have no need to be immobilized. You have no need to be caught in the tension of what you do or not to do. Just consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. Shift your perspective when you feel immobilized. Shift your perspective. Then we get a shift in priority. We get a shift in priority. In verses 16 through 21, it says this, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Can we talk about that sentence for a, saying, for a second? Uh, that was one of those that I read one time and realized, ah, oh, shoot, I never realized that one was in there. <laughs> From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. I think if we're honest as Christians, what leaves us so immobilized in our culture, in our culture, you know, we're, we're trying to follow Jesus, we're trying to honor Jesus, and it just seems like we're in a world and a culture that so often opposes him. And we want to love, we want to engage, we want to help, we want to lead people to freedom, we want to talk about things, but we don't want to, like, be jerks and, and, and hurt people's feelings and all that kind of stuff, and so what do you say? And Jesus, he steps in to give you a shift in your priority, in those situations. You know, you ever felt immobilized because of what you see in somebody's life? You want to love them, but you don't know what to do with what you see? Can we be really honest, right? Like, I know it's like not cool to say and everything, but like sometimes you're like, I don't, uh, okay. Like whether it's a, it's a lifestyle, it's a decision, it's a viewpoint, it's an opinion, it's just a, a character flaw, it's a personality trait that you just can't, you just, it's just hard to get past. Like, I want to love you, but it's hard. I'm like distracted by that. 
And you're like, want to, right? Like, I'm talking to you, like, I'm talking to me, you know? Like, I want to, but th- sometimes it's hard. And God steps in and he shifts your priority and says, no longer regard, in, uh, regard anyone according to the flesh. And then he goes on and he, he talks about this reconciliation. He says, therefore, if anyone is, a new Christ, is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. He says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. If you've been in church, you've heard these verses before. But living them's hard, (laughs) no matter how many times you hear it. Jesus comes in and he's shifting our priority because he wants to mobilize us for for today. He says, you are ambassadors of Christ. And I always thought that that word was like one of those identity words, you know, for us as believers. Like, I'm an ambassador of Jesus. Like, that's who I am. And I looked it up this week and I realized that word that's used there, it's not a noun. It's not an identity word. It's a verb. It's an action word. You are an acting demonstration of Jesus. You don't, you don't, he's not talking about your title as a believer, that now you're like an ambassador for the kingdom of God. He's saying, no, 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 you, you're, like, you're an acting influence for the kingdom of God on the earth. And yet we feel immobilized. And the shift that God wants to bring to us to mobilize us today is shifting our, what we prioritize and what we see in people. He says, no longer regard anyone according to the flesh. Only see people the way Jesus sees people. That's what's going to mobilize you. Not figuring out all the issues of today. What's going to mobilize you today is saying, Jesus, help me see what you see. I want to prioritize what Jesus says about you over what I see about you. Because God has given this ministry of reconciliation. And these shifts can only come from our third P word, revelation. <laughs> you, you only get these shifts. You, you, your perspective can only shift of where you're going to be when you get a revelation of Jesus. Your perspective of people, or your, your, your priority of what you care about, about for people can only shift when you get a revelation of Jesus. What I mean by that is that sometimes we're, we're trying to live this ministry of reconciliation. We're trying to reconcile people to their feelings. We're trying to reconcile ourselves to our emotions. We're trying to reconcile people to their past, to their, to their parents, to their, to their ex-boyfriend, to their ex-girlfriend, to their past decisions. Like, let's reconcile to all these past things. And he says, no, the appeal to God through us is be reconciled to God. That's God's cry for people, is be reconciled to me. So much so that it says Jesus did not... Can, to not hold our trespasses against us, but became sin himself so that we could become the righteousness of God. This is the appeal of God. This is the priority of God. God's highest priority for people is not that they get their sexuality or political views straight. His highest priority is that they be reconciled to God. And, and these verses, don't get me wrong, sin matters. Sin matters so much so that Jesus became sin himself. This is no joke, but it's taken care of. And he said, you are my ambassadors. God making his appeal through you. The appeal that God is making to the world is not stop sinning. Because God's priority is for you is not that you stop sinning. It wasn't sin that kept Jesus on the cross. It wasn't corrupt political people in the crowd that kept Jesus on the cross. It wasn't sexual perversion that kept Jesus on the cross. It wasn't nails that kept Jesus on the cross. The Bible doesn't say, for the world sinned so badly that God sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish and start acting rightly. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. It was love that kept Jesus on that cross. It was, it was looking at the crowd that kept Jesus on that cross. See, we need a shift of perspective. We spend so much time looking at the cross, and we need to spend our lives looking from the cross. 
When we look at the cross, we, we see Jesus and we keep people accountable for how they're not serving him rightly because we love him, right? Like, how could you offend him like that? Is that just me? Like, you're like, man, no, he's good. Like, he loves you. Stop. That's kind of the best case scenario. The other, the other worst case scenario is we look up at the cross and we see that Jesus is actually off there and we start putting other people up on it. Anybody ever done it other than me? We start crucifying people for their political opinions because we disagree with them. You know, we start crucifying people because of their sexual orientation, because of their activity, because of their choices, because of their belief system, because of all these things. And all of these things matter, but they matter at different priorities. And we need to stop looking at the cross and we need to get the perspective of Jesus, a revelation from the cross. Because it's from the cross that you see like Jesus sees. When you look into the cross, you see an opportunity to put people on it. You see the blood, you see the gore, you see the cost, you see, uh, you see, you see what, what we're not doing, you see how we're not good enough, but when you look from the cross, you see the joy set before him that held him endure the cross, scorning its shame, and now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. When you look from the cross, you get to see through the eyes of reconciliation. When you look from the cross, you see you can spit on me, you can, you can, you can scathe me, you can curse me all you want, but this blood runs for you. That's what you see from the cross. We need a shift. We need a shift of our perspective. We need a shift in our priorities. That yes, there's a lot of brokenness in this world, and it matters. And that brokenness needs healing. It needs Jesus. But it starts with reconciliation. It starts with reconciliation. And I want to encourage you, I want to mobilize you this morning as the people of God to prioritize people being right with God over you, over them thinking you're right. (laughs) It's supposed to be really encouraging and free, (laughs) but it's really challenging and convicting. (laughs) Let your priorities shift from everybody thinking you're right to everybody being right with God. And see the joy that comes into your life. See the pain and the tension, absolutely. But God will leave you, let you have his perspective when you keep his priorities. And we'll get there. We'll get to the stuff. We'll get there for sure. But I want to do it like Jesus did, right? I want to I focus on the price for it all getting paid first. So that as I'm helping people through their process, I'm not making them pay the price. This is who God is, and this is who we are as his people. God wants you mobilized today, right now, in your life, in your relationships, your friendships, to see Jesus today, to help people know Jesus today, to be a carrier of this message of reconciliation today. This is the message of Jesus, and this is the appeal that God is making to to the world through us, his church. His appeal is not that everybody understand how wrong they are. The appeal is not that they all understand how right we are. The appeal is to make known the opportunity for all of humanity to be right with God through the grace of Jesus Christ. And if we can start there, we can cross any bridge. We can take down any wall. We can fight through any barrier. We can love anybody. We can see any transformation. There is no heart too hard for the love of Jesus. You are an ambassador for Christ. God is making his appeal through you. (laughs) He is making his appeal through you to your family, to your friends, your coworkers, your Instagram followers, your Facebook friends, your neighborhood, and the nations of the earth. Be reconciled to God. This is the cry of heaven. And you are free to prioritize that over everything else. And when you do, when we do, we will step into freedom. We will step into freedom we will step into power. And that's what I believe God wants for you, for his church, and for the nations of the earth. That's what Jesus wants today. I want us to stand as we close this morning. We're going to worship Jesus. I'm going to worship him because he reconciled me. I don't know why you're going to worship Jesus, (laughs) but that's why I'm going to. 
Anybody got any smiles left this morning? It's like immediately go to, okay, we're going to worship. Everyone's like, okay, let's do this. I want us to take these final few minutes together to present ourselves to the Holy Spirit, to put ourselves before him and just say, God, come and have your way. Come and shift my perspective. Come and shift my priorities. Another big church word that we can get get scared of is the word conviction, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I love, number one, that that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which means it's not the church's world to go make sure everybody's convicted of all their stuff. The Holy Spirit's a big boy and he can handle it himself. Jesus said, you carry this message of reconciliation. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit always leads us to freedom. The conviction of the Holy Spirit leads us to repentance. Another big scary church word. What all that word means is freedom. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life and he, and he brings conviction into your life, he's trying to bring you to repentance. He's trying to bring you to the point where you realize I'm holding on to something that's killing me and I don't have to anymore, so I'm not. And you let go and you turn and you come and you step into the presence of God and you live your life in freedom. And I believe that in these moments, God wants to lead us to repentance as his people. And I think that there's uh, any number of people in here, maybe all of us who have been hurt and treated poorly by a church with the wrong perspective, by people with the wrong priorities in the name of Jesus. I know I've done it. Forget if I've ever experienced it, I've done it. But we stand before the mercy seat this morning. And God loves you, he loves his church, and he's not given up on any of his plan A. That is you, and that is us. By the power of the Holy Spirit this morning, we can step in today to what God's calling us to. And I wanna invite you in this moment to open up your life and just say, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you come and would you convict me? Show me anywhere that my perspective needs to shift. Where am I prioritizing, worrying so much about today that I'm not doing anything today? Where am I missing out on what's coming tomorrow and it's clouding my judgment for today, Lord? Would you convict me of my perspective and and ask him to convict you of your priorities? Lord, what am I distracted by? What flesh am I distracted by? Don't look at yourself according to the flesh anymore. And don't look at anybody else. Lord, where am I distracted by the things of the flesh that are keeping me from being able to simply love people and bring them into this ministry of reconciliation? We're gonna have people off to the side to pray with you. If you want prayer, you are at church, so do not leave without it if you need it. You're not gonna get it tomorrow at work probably, so do it now. We love you. Nobody else is looking at you. They're all looking at Jesus anyway. So go get what you need. Pray with somebody. Pray with the person who brought you. Let somebody pray for you if you need it today. And if you're here this morning and you need to give your life to Jesus, do it today. Do it today. You don't know when tomorrow is coming. Do it today. And step into the life that God has called you to. He is mobilizing you into life today. Talk with the person who you came with. Go have somebody pray with you at the end. And I know that we do this sometimes, and this isn't at all for effect. This is all just for response, and this is just how I respond all the time. And I just think that there might be some things that we need to respond to and leave behind, and sometimes you need a physical response to that. And so I know for me, during this next song, I'm going to be up at the front right up here, laying it all out and saying, God, I, I, I repent. I, I've been distracted by a bad perspective. I've been distracted by the wrong priorities. And sometimes I need to just run and leave it all in the back of the room, leave it all in the chair and come up to the front. And I want to invite you, if you need to respond, maybe you stay in your chair. But if you need to come to the front, because you need to seal it in your heart, no, I left that behind. I wanna encourage you to do that this morning. Whether you need prayer, you need to stay in your seat, come to the front, give your life to Jesus, whatever it is, now is the time. Jesus is here. The Holy Spirit is in the room. It's your time to respond to God this morning. So I want you to do that right after I pray for us. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for your word, and we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come into our lives right now. Lord, come into your church. Flood us, Holy Spirit, with conviction. Lord, lead us in your mercy. 
Give us perspective this morning. Shape our priorities this morning. Lead us to repentance individually and as a church. And God, I'm asking for the city of Indianapolis that they would encounter the people of God with right perspective, the people of God with proper priorities, and that, Lord, we would carry this ministry of reconciliation to our neighbors, to our friends, and to the nations of the earth by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.